just want to thank all you guys for coming out. This looks like a great turnout. Um, tonight's topic, agnosticism versus Christianity. Can we know that God exists? Um, this event is sponsored by the USC Philosophy Department and Campus Crusade for Christ. Um, tonight, I'm your MC. My name is Brian Fuller. I'm a sophomore at USC. Go Gamecocks. And I'll go on record right now for saying that I'm probably the, well, I am, without a doubt, the least intelligent person on stage tonight. So that's my claim right there. Okay, um, tonight our presenters are going to have a timed period to uh, make their introduction and their opening statements, followed by uh, subsequent time periods to make responses to things that have possibly been said uh, through the course of the, the debate. Um, I'd like to uh, introduce our moderator right now, uh, Mr. Ephraim Miller. He uh, lives in Columbia with his wife, Lark Adams, and their three daughters. He's also a graduate of the Citadel and the USC School of Law. Since 1973, he's been employed by an investment counselor, and he is a partner in the firm of Godsey and Gibb Associates, with offices in Columbia and Richmond, Virginia. So, if you would welcome Mr. Ephraim Palmer. It's quite clear what the responsibility of the other two gentlemen on the stage tonight uh, is. Uh, it was not quite so clear to me as to why I was chosen or what uh, my responsibilities might be. In fact, I, I went home after uh, agreeing to take this job and while sitting in the breakfast room thinking out loud about uh, why I might have been picked, uh, I had in my hand the brochure that many of you, uh, the flyer that many of you may have seen posted around campus and in other places that showed the two pictures of tonight's speakers. My six-year-old daughter came up to me hearing me uh, lament and question uh, about my selection, and she said, Papa, it's very simple. You have whiskers, too. <laughs> uh, I thought that certainly was an enlightened uh, view. Uh, my wife wouldn't let me glory in it too long, though. Uh, she immediately responded that it was probably uh, more because uh, those that selected me realized that I had three children age four, six, and eight, and that I was very accustomed to saying, please stop talking. <laughs> One of the last centuries most uh, renowned philosophers and mathematicians and Englishmen by the name of Bertrand Russell was imprisoned in 1918 for his activity as editor of a newspaper uh, during the Second, uh, First World War in England. Um, he was taken to prison for six months and being a fairly well-regarded uh, academician at that point in his life, the warden of the prison came down to help Mr. Russell fill out the paperwork uh, that was necessary for his admission for this six months in prison. And when he got to the point about the question about religion, the warden uh, was puzzled when Bertrand Russell claimed to be an agnostic. He immediately looked up with that uh, understated look of Englishman, and he said, would you please spell that for me, sir? He said, there's so many religions around that I can't keep up with all of them, but I guess it's okay because y'all must all worship the same God. <laughs> the uh, program this evening will involve four sequences of statement and reply by the presenters this evening. There will be an initial opening statement of 20 minutes for each of the speakers. There will be a 12-minute response by each of the speakers, followed by an opportunity to rebut for eight minutes, and then finally a closing statement of five minutes. Following the formal presentation, there will be an opportunity for uh, those of you who might have questions for either of the speakers to come forward to the mic 
asked the question, the individual that the question is asked of will have two minutes to respond, and then the other person will be given one minute um, to respond to the, the answer. We're very privileged to have in Columbia and at this program this evening, uh, Dr. Rig Hughes, who will be supporting the position of agnosticism. Dr. Hughes is a professor of philosophy here at the University of South Carolina. The philosophy department was one of the co-hosts of the program this evening. Dr. Hughes received uh, his baccalaureate degree as well as a master's degree from Cambridge University and was awarded his PhD from the University of British Columbia. Following that time, he has taught at the University of Toronto, at Princeton University, at Yale, at the University of Oregon, and now at the University of South Carolina, where in addition to his teaching responsibilities, he is Director of Graduate Studies for the Department of Philosophy. Supporting the position for Christianity this evening will be William Lane Craig. Dr. Craig and his family are visiting Columbia from Atlanta, where Dr. Craig presently is a visiting scholar at Emory University. Dr. Craig received his baccalaureate degree from Wheaton College, two master's degrees from Trinity Evangelical Divinity School, and a PhD from the University of Birmingham, England. In an effort to frame the question this evening as we get underway, we must realize that we are in, we are participating in a continuing conversation, a debate this evening which is a question that has been asked through the ages. And if we can imagine for a moment early man finally realizing that there were powers outside himself that were greater than himself and that if he were somehow able to manipulate these powers that he could make life a bit better. Primitive man went into the jungle in search of food and when he returned from the hunt, if the hunt was successful, he would thank the god of the animal, of the deer, of the antelope, or the bear. He would take the skin of the animal and he would fashion a costume, a robe as it were, or vestments. He would place the head of the animal on his own head. He would build a campfire and around that campfire he would dance. If his hunt had been successful. His act was one of thanksgiving. If his hunt had been unsuccessful, he would presume that the god of the animal was somehow opposed or angry with him. And so his dance would be one of sacrifice, attempting to gain the favor of the god of that animal. And the lightning would flash, and the thunder would shake the earth, and the rains would fall. And early man began to imagine that these gods resided at the seat of this power. I can imagine that on one occasion, at some point in time, around that campfire, the question was raised, can we really know if God exists? And from that time forward, with a cacophony of voices through the ages, the question has been asked over and over and over again. And it is that question tonight that will be addressed by 
our two speakers for at this time and in this place we again ask the question can we know if God exists our first speaker this evening will be Dr. Hughes Thank you very much, Mr. Ms. Rulma. And I'd also like to thank the Campus Crusade for Christ who are organizing this event this evening, on whom all, virtually all the organizational tasks have fallen. And in particular, I'd like to thank uh, Mike, Michael Brent and Skid Logan, the people with whom I've um, negotiated, if that's the word, and uh, who have communicated with me ever since the, the project was mooted sometime last fall. And let me greet also Professor Craig on behalf of the university and specifically on behalf of the philosophy department. Uh, I'd like to say that that's the only activity I'm doing on behalf of the philosophy department this evening, that is to say greeting Professor Craig. The views I shall present are my own. And those of my colleagues who happen to be here tonight, what well, I hope regard them with their usual tolerance. <laughs> uh, one rather selfish pleasure that this event has presented to me is an opportunity to sort out some of my own thoughts on the topic of this, this debate. Can we know that God exists? Now this may sound rather surprising. Given that I'm a professional philosopher, you might expect these topics, or this particular topic, to be, as it were, the bread and butter of my working life. Well, in fact, it isn't. And furthermore, I think it's significant to this discussion that it isn't. And let me explain that. There is, for instance, in the recent literature um, of uh, our, uh, looking at the question of our knowledge of the existence of God, um, one argument for the existence of God that makes use of the resources of modern modal logic, the logic of necessity and possibility. Uh, there is another that I'm now quoting, uses scientific evidence to prove the existence of God beyond a reasonable doubt. Now, I touch, I teach, and I write on both logic and the philosophy of science, but neither of these arguments comes within my purview. And the reason is that the first argument uses a very strong, what you might call, extra-logical premise to arrive at the conclusion. And it turns out, in fact, that this very strong pre premise is effectively equivalent to the conclusion that the author wants to generate. Uh, the second argument, though it does indeed appeal to certain theoretical results of modern science, is not itself a scientific argument. So, what I want to suggest is that neither logic nor science on their own have anything much to say about the existence of God. So it's hardly so, as surprising as it might seem that I come to this debate as an interested amateur, so to speak, rather than as a professional. Now, in fact, the, the, the really um, remarkable, astounding philosopher Immanuel Kant suggested that there's an important sense in which in this area we can only be interested amateurs. I'm referring to a discussion of his in his book The Critique of Pure Reason which was published in the 1780s and uh, in which his claim was that in trying to demonstrate the existence of God, in trying to show how it could be proved beyond a reasonable doubt, pure reason went beyond the bounds to which it could be usefully applied. Our reason, he said, is equipped to deal with the world of orderly experience. But God is not part of that world. Notice, in fact, that Kant said this despite the fact that he was himself a devout Christian. In fact, he described one of his two tasks in the Critique of Pure Reason as that of making room for faith. 
Thus, a belief in God's existence, existence is not inconsistent with a skeptical view towards, a skeptical attitude towards various arguments that purport to prove that existence. Um, so, if one interprets the question of the debate exactly as written, namely, can we know that God exists? The example of Kant suggests that the two sides of the debate, the representatives of Christianity and agnosticism, can agree that the answer is no. We cannot know that God exists. And in fact, there's a long tradition within Christianity that suggests that faith is distinct from knowledge. And in the last century, I take Kierkegaard to be one of the notable, uh, the, the notable proponents of such a view. There is, however, another tradition to which Dr. Craig belongs, in fact, to which he's been a, a notable contributor. And that suggests that knowledge and faith supplement and mutually support each other. And that's a tradition that goes back to figures like Anselm in the 11th century, in particular Aquinas in the uh, 13th century, and those are figures to whom uh, I'll come back later. But let me repeat, you do not have to be an agnostic to reject the view that knowledge, that our reason can lead to knowledge of God's existence. Another point I'd like to emphasize in these opening remarks is that, as in any claim of knowledge, the burden of proof lies with the person who makes the claim. For, in for instance, a couple of years ago, a mathematician claimed to have a proof of Fermat's last theorem. This is a theorem which um, the mathematician Fermat, uh, 200 years ago, um, claimed to have proved. He left a marginal note in one of his books saying he proved a significant theorem. Now, this theorem is a rather remarkable theorem because it's extraordinarily easy to state. I won't actually state it here, but you know, I could state it given another five minutes. Um, but it proved fantastically difficult to prove. In fact, no one now thinks that Fermat himself had a watertight proof. As I said, two years ago, a mathematician, his name was Timothy Wiles, claimed to have a proof. And ever since then, he's been working to repair the holes that other mathematicians have found in it. He may well succeed, but my point here is, quite rightly, the burden of proof is on him to do so, to repair those holes. Again, if someone claims that a certain, a certain drug produced by the pharmaceutical industry has great, efficient, great efficacy and no side effects, we don't accept that on trust. That's what the FDA are for. The FDA are to, there to provide clinical trials of this, of this, trust, in order, of this drug in order to test it. I say this partly because it may seem that during the debate that my responses are, as you might call, might say, dogmatically skeptical. I will often say, there's a problem with this argument, or words to that effect. But this is not a dogmatic skepticism, I want to claim. Um, Think of the mathematicians who worked through Wiles's proof. They were properly skeptical. They inspected every move. Again, the FDA, uh, the FDA, the Food and Drug Administration, are properly careful in designing and conducting clinical trials. But the situation with any claim concerning God's existence is even more is even more problematic than any uh, than either of the ones I've uh, I've mentioned. We know what counts as persuasive evidence of a, of a particular fact of mathematics. It's a valid proof of that fact. We know what counts as persuasive evidence of the efficacy of a particular drug, the kind of evidence that is supplied by the clinical trials that the FDA supplied. Note that I said persuasive. I did not say conclusive. While we may have conclusive, uh, uh, conclusive evidence about the validity of mathematical Theorem. We don't have conclusive evidence about the properties of a drug.
Now, I have said enough to show, I hope, that we ought to look very carefully at any argument that purports to be a proof of God's existence. What I'll do in the remaining 11 minutes of my opening, uh, uh, opening remarks is to look at one particular argument which is of historical interest. One of my reasons for choosing a historical argument is partly because it was set out very simply by the person who did it, namely uh, St. Thomas Aquinas. Secondly, that because the things he takes for granted are things we are most likely to challenge because we're a certain intellectual distance from him. And this argument is one of five that he produces. It's known as the, the second way. There are five ways, he says, to prove God's existence, and this is the second. Uh, and it's an argument to the effect that there must be a first cause in the universe, or uh, in the universe taken at large. And it has three, three assumptions. One is that there is an order of causation, that A causes B, B causes C, C causes D within the, within the cosmos. Second is the idea that nothing causes itself. And thirdly is the proposition that an infinite series of such causes, of such a cause and effect relationships, is impossible. So we have these three principles, which are called the ordering principle, that causes follow one after the other. They're linearly ordered, as mathematicians would say. A causes B, B causes C, and so on. Secondly, the no self-causing principle, nothing causes itself. Thirdly, that an infinite cause-effect sequence is not possible. Okay. Now, if you think about these three principles, these three metaphysical principles as we may call them, they seem to be mutually at odds, one with the other. How does Aquinas solve the problem? Not by asking which of them he's going to have to discard. No. What he does is actually to follow the lead of the Athenian dramatist Euripides. Euripides, whenever he got to a certain stage in a plot where there was an enormous amount of confusion going on, he didn't know what, what to do, he flew in a god onto the stage on the stage cranes, which they had in the Athenian theater, and this god became known as a deus ex machina, the, day, the god who was flown in on the machine. And what we have in Aquinas' proof is a deus ex machina flow in, flown in as part of the argument. What we might think of as a supernatural first clause, cause, using supernatural in its literal sense. Now, this, uh, sorry, um, this first cause has very astonishing properties. You might ask how the first cause uh, manages to avoid conflict with the no self-causation principle, that nothing can be the cause of itself. And Aquinas' answer is ingenious or evasive, depending on your point of view. He tells us the first cause is not self-caused, it's uncaused. Now, read as a proof of the existence of God, it, it's a somewhat dubious piece of argumentation. I should add that it's the, this first cause, Aquinas tells us, that I quote, all men call God. I'd like to draw attention to three aspects of the proof and of the, and of the setting in which the proof appeared. First, we have the enunciation of various metaphysical, metaphysical principles. I call them metaphysicals because they don't deal with specific types of events and processes in the world. They abstract from these and are set down as general principles that are held to govern all kinds of events and processes. And those are the three I, I, I outlined. You know, the, uh, the no infinity principle, and the no self causation principle, and the linear ordering principle. Um, only one of these, in fact, is argued for in the least in Aquinas' rather truncated proof uh, when he goes through this argument. That's the no infinity principle. 
Now, in fact, Aquinas' strategy allows him, on the one hand, to retain these metaphysical metaphysical principles and to deduce his required conclusion for the existence of the first cause whom all men call God. But he does so, he, he manages to do that by going outside the realm, I would say, to which those principles properly apply. The realm of what um, classical philosophy, that's Greek philosophy called physics, and we would call nature. So that's the first point. We have these metaphysical principles which are hung on to, but nevertheless Aquinas goes outside them for his conclusion. Secondly, the point is, what is the nature of the conclusion he draws from the argument? And the conclusion is that there is a first cause which itself is uncaused. Note that there's not much theological content in there. So let us say for the sake of argument that uh, for, the, for the sake of argument that, that, um, that uh, Aquinas has been successful in proving the existence of this first cause, what belief do we come away with? Well, it's a belief which actually would barely cover the first two lines of the Nicene Creed. Nicene Creed begins I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible. And that's about all we get to in the Nicene Creed but if we accept the proof of the existence of God. All that follows has not been proved. Notice, actually, even that phrase, those phrases I've included go a bit farther than Aquinas' proof because they, um, uh, there's a reference to the Father Almighty, which wasn't part of, was not at all part of, um, of Aquinas' proof. Uh, finally, let me note again the third, uh, sorry, the, as the third point, the phrase that appears at the end of this particular proof, and I may say of all, all five of those proofs which are laid out successively, that after proving, for instance, the first, the existence of the first mover in the first way, and the first cause in the second way, and the necessary being in the third way, and so on. In each case, Aquinas says, and this all men call God. Notice, all men here includes not Christians specifically, but theists of all persuasions. That is, pagan Greeks, followers of Islam, Judaism, and Christians. Okay. Uh, this brings me to my final, my final comment on Aquinas' proofs, that probably for Aquinas, we're not to read them as proofs of the existence of God in the way we think. What Aquinas is trying to do is to reconcile Greek philosophy, particularly Aristotelian philosophy, which the Western world had recently been re reacquainted with, with faith. These five ways are ways. They're ways to understand the nature of the divine being. But Aquinas never really disputes or discusses or even doubts the existence of such a being. These are not proofs as we know it, starting from an agnostic position and designed, designed to persuade the agnostic person. They're designed to show that there's a nice harmony between the Christian theism to which he already belonged, and the uh, and the the Greek philosophy to whom to whom he was so much attracted, and what I would suggest is that this is a characteristic of many of these proofs, many proofs of the existence of God. In fact, many attempts to arrive at a knowledge of God, including the knowledge of His existence, via uh, a rational argument, that. These proofs are undertaken to show that reason and faith, as it were, are in harmony. But they're not, they, they're not, they, will not they will not persuade, they're very unlikely to persuade um, someone who's of an agnostic uh, turn of mind, someone who who insists that the burden of proof is on the theist, 
and is inclined to take a is inclined to take a skeptical view of such arguments. Thank you. Good evening. I also want to begin by expressing my thanks to Campus Crusade for Christ and the Philosophy Department at USC for inviting me to participate in the debate, and also to say how privileged I feel to be debating Dr. Hughes. His own work in philosophy of science has served as a resource for me in my own writing and research, and it's a privilege to share the podium with him tonight. In tonight's debate, I'm going to defend two basic contentions. First of all, that agnosticism is untenable in a number of ways, and then secondly, that Christian theism is rationally well-founded. Let's look first at that uh, first major contention that agnosticism is untenable in numerous ways. Now the first thing that we need to understand is that there are different varieties of agnosticism. There is, for example, what we might call ordinary agnosticism which is really just a personal confession of ignorance as to whether God exists or not. On the other hand, there's what we might call ornery agnosticism, which says that you can't know whether God exists or not. Now, in my critique of agnosticism, I'm going to make basically four points concerning these. Number one, ornery agnosticism is philosophically untenable. Ordinary agnosticism says that it's impossible to know whether God exists or not. Now that is a very bold and sweeping claim. It needs justification. Anybody who defends that claim is making an assertion and also has to bear the burden of proof. But the problem is that no one has been able to come up with a good argument that the knowledge of God is impossible. Kant's argument, referred to by Dr. Hughes, for example, is system dependent upon Kant's theory of knowledge, uh, which virtually no one today adopts. And therefore, Kant's agnosticism, I think, provides no grounds for holding to this sort of ornery agnosticism. And in fact, Dr. Hughes, I don't think, would defend this dogmatic agnosticism. But that leads me then to my second point, that ordinary agnosticism is practically untenable. You see, the ordinary agnostic is in a position of doubt and maybe even bewilderment. He hears arguments for theism on the one hand, and maybe some of these arguments seem pretty convincing to him. On the other hand, he hears arguments for atheism, which in his mind have exactly the same weight as the arguments for theism. The arguments pro and con must be exactly equal in their weight so that in the agnostic's mind, the scales in which the evidence is being weighed are absolutely balanced and do not tip one way or the other. Now, my argument is that such a position, while possible theoretically, is impossible practically. Though you might go through a temporary crisis of agnosticism, sooner or later as you go through life, the scales will tip in one direction or the other in your thinking. They don't need to tip decisively, as Dr. Hughes has said. To be an atheist, you don't need to be 100% positive that God does not exist. And to be a theist, you don't need to have absolute certainty that God exists. It's just on balance that one alternative seems more probable in your thinking than the other. Let me illustrate my point. My kids have a joke about what would happen if a rooster laid a, an egg on the peak of the barn roof. Which way would the egg roll? Well, the kids get out of that dilemma by pointing out that roosters don't lay eggs. But things aren't so easy for the agnostic. You see, the agnostic's philosophical egg has to stay balanced precisely on the peak of the roof, lest it roll to the one side, which is atheism, or to the other side, which is theism. And it has to do this balancing act throughout an entire lifetime. But that's just impossible, practically. Sooner or later, the probabilities will lean in one direction or the other in your thinking. And you'll either believe there probably is a God, or else 
there probably is no God. So the debate tonight really is, in the end, between theism and atheism. And you have to decide in your thinking which one is more probably true. That leads me to my third point. Either type of agnosticism is existentially untenable. That is to say, agnosticism is personally unlivable because it leaves undecided man's deepest existential questions about the meaning and value of life. Whether God exists or not is going to have a decisive effect upon how you answer such questions personally. For if God does not exist, man and the universe are without ultimate meaning or value. On the atheistic view, the universe is the result of a cosmic accident, doomed to self-destruct in the relatively distant but finite future. And mankind is a briefly existent species of primate lost on an infinitesimal speck of solar dust and destined only to inevitable destruction in the heat death of the universe. In the end, it makes absolutely no difference whether man and the universe ever existed or not. They are therefore without ultimate meaning or significance. Similarly, on the atheistic view, there are no objective standards of moral value of right and wrong. Moral values are either just the expression of personal taste or else judgments about behavior ingrained into us by ev evolution or society. There are no objective, transcendent values which tell us what we ought and ought not to do. And even if there were, why do what is right when it conflicts with your own self-interest? There's no hereafter, so why not live totally for self? Acts of self-sacrifice are particularly inept on an atheistic worldview. Why should I give up my all too brief existence for the sake of someone else? Forget it. If there is no immortality, then let's just eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. The point that I'm trying to make is that the choice between atheism and theism is one that touches all of us at the deepest level of our being and determines how we shall answer the profoundly practical question, how shall I then live? Since the agnostic either cannot or will not answer the question about God's existence, neither can he answer the practical question about how he should live. But the problem is that the practical question is existentially unavoidable. For every day, we do go on living, and so implicitly answer the question, how shall I then live? Are you going to live like atheism is true, as though life has no meaning or value, or like theism is true? Every day, by your behavior, you implicitly answer this question. Agnosticism is thus existentially untenable. It's a nice theory that cannot be lived. And finally, we come to my fourth point. Rational agnosticism is not incompatible with Christianity. Now, this may come as something of a surprise, but it's a fact that many of the greatest skeptics in history were also Christian believers. And a great many of today's most influential philosophers, such as Alvin Plantinga, William Alston, and John Hick, hold that it is rational to believe in God even without arguments. And Dr. Hughes' uh, example of Immanuel Kant would be another illustration of this point. You see, rational agnosticism presupposes that in order for a belief to be rational, you have to have arguments in favor of that belief. But that presupposition is simply false. For we all accept various beliefs, like the existence of the external world or the reality of the past, which are completely unprovable and yet are rational to hold. These are what philosophers call properly basic beliefs. That is to say, beliefs which arise appropriately out of our experience, but cannot be proved from that experience. Now, the question this raises is, why can't belief in God's existence be a properly basic belief rooted in my experience of God himself? That does not mean that it's arbitrary, any more than my belief in the external world is arbitrary. Rather, it is grounded in my personal experience of God himself. If this is correct, 
then agnosticism becomes somewhat irrelevant. For one could be agnostic about proving God's existence and yet still be a Christian theist by taking God's existence as properly basic. And here, I think, is a point of unanimity between Dr. Hughes and myself if I understood what he was saying in that first speech. So for these four reasons, I think we can conclude my first major contention that agnosticism is untenable in numerous ways. Now that brings me to my second major contention that I want to defend tonight, and that is that Christianity is rationally well-founded. Let me reiterate that I'm not claiming you can prove that God exists with some kind of mathematical certainty. I'm just saying that when you weigh the evidence for atheism versus Christian theism, the scales of, the, of probability tip in the direction of Christian theism. So let me share a couple of arguments which I think make it probable that God exists. Number one, the evidence points to a creator of the universe. Have you ever asked yourself where the universe came from? Why anything at all exists instead of just nothing? Typically, atheists have said that the universe is just uncaused and eternal, and that's all. But surely this is unreasonable. Just think about it for a minute. If the universe never had a beginning, then that means that the number of past events in the history of the universe is infinite. But mathematicians know that an actually infinite number of things leads to self-contradictions. For example, what is infinity minus infinity? Well, mathematically, you get self-contradictory answers. That shows that infinity is just an idea, not something that exists in reality. David Hilbert, perhaps the greatest mathematician of this century, states, the infinite is nowhere to be found in reality. It neither exists in nature nor provides a legitimate basis for rational thought. The role that remains for the infinite to play is solely that of an idea. But that entails that since past events are not just ideas but are real, the number of past events must be finite. Therefore, the series of past events can't go back forever. Rather, the universe must have begun to exist. This conclusion has been confirmed by remarkable discoveries in astronomy and astrophysics. The astrophysical evidence indicates that the universe began to exist in a great explosion called the Big Bang about 15 billion years ago. Physical space and time were created in that event, as well as all the matter and energy in the universe. Therefore, as Cambridge astronomer Fred Hoyle points out, the Big Bang theory requires the creation of the universe from nothing. This is because as you go back in time, you reach a point at which, in Hoyle's words, the universe was shrunk down to nothing at all. Thus, what the Big Bang model requires is that the universe began to exist and was created out of nothing. Now this tends to be very awkward for the atheist. For as Anthony Kenny of Oxford University points out, a proponent of the Big Bang Theory, at least if he is an atheist, must believe that the universe came from nothing and by nothing. But that's a pretty hard pill to swallow. Out of nothing, nothing comes. So why does the universe exist? Where did it come from? There must have been a cause which brought the universe into being. From the very nature of the case, this cause must be an uncaused, changeless, timeless, and immaterial being of enormous power which created the universe, which is the core conception of the Christian concept of God. Isn't it incredible that the Big Bang Theory thus points to what the Christian has always believed? that in the beginning, God created the universe. Now, I simply put it to you, which is more probable, that the Christian theist is right, or that the universe just popped into being, uncaused, out of nothing? Now, I don't have any trouble, at least, assessing these probabilities. Now, Dr. Hughes objects to this by saying that this is a deus ex machina, a God out of the machine, to reconcile these inconsistent premises of Thomas Aquinas. Let me share with you what the premises are, and I think you can see they are not in any way inconsistent. Number one, whatever begins to exist has a cause. Number two, the universe began to exist. Conclusion, therefore, the universe has a cause of its existence. That is a deductively valid argument. It is in no way an appeal to a deus ex machina. 
Uh, moreover, I think that this does show the attributes of God because it shows several of the central attributes of God, and it's part of a cumulative case, as we'll see in a minute, in which the other attributes of God, I think, become quite, uh, quite evident. So it seems to me that there is significant theological content to this conclusion. Number two, the evidence points to an intelligent designer of the cosmos. During the last 25 years, scientists have been stunned to discover that the, intelligent, uh, the existence of intelligent life depends upon a complex and delicate balance of initial conditions simply given in the Big Bang itself. We now know that life-prohibiting universes are vastly more probable than life, uh, our life-prohibiting universes are more probable than life-permitting universes like ours. How much more probable? Well, according to Donald Page, one of America's eminent cosmologists, the odds of our universe existing are on the order of one chance out of 10 to the power of 10 to the 124th power, a number which is so inconceivable that to call it astronomical would be a wild understatement. Robert Jastrow, the head of NASA's Goddard Institute for Space Studies, has called this the most powerful evidence for the existence of God ever to come out of science. Indeed, in light of these odds, I think it takes more faith to believe in atheism than it does to believe in a personal intelligent designer of the universe. Number three, the evidence points to God as the source of objective moral values. If God does not exist, then objective moral values do not exist. Many theists and atheists alike concur on this point. For example, Professor Michael Roos, a philosopher of science, writes, Morality is a biological adaptation, no less than our hands and feet and teeth. Considered as a rationally justifiable set of claims about an objective something, ethics is illusory. Morality is just an aid to survival and reproduction, and any deeper meaning is illusory. On the atheistic view, some action like rape may not be socially advantageous, and so in the course of human development has become taboo. But that does absolutely nothing to prove that rape is really wrong. On the atheistic view, if you can escape the social consequences, there's nothing really wrong with your raping someone. Thus, without God, there is no absolute right and wrong which imposes itself on our conscience. But the fact is that objective values do exist, and we all know it. There's no more reason to deny the objective reality of moral values than the objective reality of the physical world. Actions like rape, brutality, torture, and child abuse aren't just socially unacceptable behavior. They're moral abominations. Even Roos himself admits, the man who says it is morally acceptable to rape little children is just as mistaken as the man who says two plus two equals five. Some things are really wrong. But if objective values cannot exist without God, and objective values do exist, then it follows logically and inescapably that God exists. Finally, number four, the evidence points to God's decisively revealing himself in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ claimed to be the absolute revelation of God, and that claim was confirmed through his resurrection from the dead. If Jesus did rise from the dead, then we have a divine miracle on our hands and thus evidence for the existence of God. Among the historical facts that support the resurrection of Jesus, two stand out. The empty tomb and Jesus' appearance as alive after his death. Let's look very briefly at each of these. First, the evidence indicates that Jesus' tomb was found empty by a group of his women followers on Sunday morning. According to Jakob Kreber, an Austrian scholar who has specialized in the study of the resurrection, by far, most scholars hold firmly to the reliability of biblical statements about the empty tomb. According to D.H. Van Dalen, it is extremely difficult to object to the empty tomb on historical grounds. Those who deny it do so on the basis of theological or philosophical assumptions. Second, the evidence indicates that on separate occasions, different individuals and groups saw appearances of Jesus alive after his death. According to the late Norman Perrin of the University of Chicago, the more we investigate the traditions with regard to the appearances, the firmer the rock begins to appear upon which they are based. These appearances were bodily and physical and were witnessed not only by believers, but also by skeptics, unbelievers, and even enemies. The simple fact is that there just is no plausible 
naturalistic explanation of these facts. And therefore, it seems to me, we're amply justified in believing that in fact God raised Jesus from the dead just as the earliest Christians proclaimed. Thus, I think that there are good reasons to believe that Christian theism is rationally well-founded. So in conclusion then, we've seen four reasons why agnosticism is untenable in various ways, and we've seen four reasons which provide a powerful cumulative case for the rationality of Christian theism. And therefore, I'm persuaded, and I think we can safely conclude, that belief in Christian theism is better justified than an attitude of skeptical agnosticism. Our next round will give each presenter a 12-minute opportunity to respond to any points that were made by the opposing position, or to amplify anything that was uh, brought up in their opening uh, statement. Uh, Dr. Thank you. Uh, what I'm going to respond to in this particular, this particular round, uh, first of all, is the question of the, very briefly, of the, uh, whether one can just uh, live, as a, live as a skeptic and live as an ag agnostic. And one, uh, in particular, I'm not going to respond in this round to the questions about um, uh, attitude to ethics or uh, the meaning of life. Um, then I wanted to say some things about these uh, arguments uh, from the physics of the Big Bang to the existence of the Creator. Now, I, I speak as a kind of happy agnostic. I don't feel... Um, <laughs> that I have, I'm in continual torment about torn one way or the other. And I think there's a radical difference between this kind of agnosticism about, uh, uh, about God and agnosticism, for instance, about the existence of the external world, right? Um, it has often been said that thoroughbred skeptics, people who are skeptical about everything, including the external world, including the um, in, including the existence of God, have a tendency to kind of uh, stab themselves with their own weapons. And Montaigne uses the, uh, uh, uses the image of holding your enemy close to you while you'll stab him with your sword towards yourself. And you can overdo this. Um, and uh, <laughs> clearly, if I am a skeptic, about the external world, and those beliefs, those beliefs get, or the, the, those skeptical beliefs get translated into behaviors. I will do myself no good at all. Yeah. And so, as as various very skeptical philosophers, Montaigne, Hume among them, have said, clearly that <coughs> kind of skepticism is belied by the person's actions. It's a it's a purely uh, it's a stated skepticism, but not a lived skepticism. And I think that's true, particularly of the other one which uh, Dr. Craig mentioned, that is the skepticism about the external world. Uh, I will talk in the next round about why I don't th think it's true about, uh, uh, about the skepticism or agnosticism with regard to the existence of God. Um, let me move on to the particular questions of um, the particular questions that arise concerning the Big Bang arguments. And there are two such arguments. There's the, the, sim the straightforward argument that the Big Bang, the, 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 the model of the creation, the, uh, the model of the beginning of the universe um, that uh, portrays it as emerging in one large explosion requires an explanation of how can it come out of nothing. And there's the second argument, sometimes called the anthropic principle argument, the fine-tuning, as it's called sometimes, of the physical constants of the world at a very early stage of the creative creation process had uh, a very small chance of giving rise to the creation of organic molecules and then um, hence the creation of um, organic chemistry and hence the creation of pre-med exams. 
um, but more generally, a very small chance of producing life in general. But the fine tuning was exactly, precisely that which produced um, that which produced life in general and human life in particular. Okay. Now. <clears throat> One of the major problems uh, about the question of what happened to bring the universe in, into, uh, in, into existence, the cosmos, I should say, into existence, is how we are actually going to describe it. It's been described as the act of a creator. And often, though I don't think I heard Dr. Craig use the um, uh, this time, it's often described act, uh, that the Creator chose this universe. Now, both those things are very hard to, they're, they're, those are very hard, um, hard to, to hang on to that mode of description if you simultaneously say that the Creator lived through, uh, uh, lived in a, in a timeless world. Because the notion of creation, the notion of making a choice, are essentially time-bound notions. And we're trying to apply them in an area or in, in, a, in, in a kind of um, in an area of, uh, of discussion where they have no business. So that, like everybody else, I don't know what happened before the universe began. In fact, there was no before the universe began. Because time came into existence, time, space-time came into existence with the universe. So, arguments, uh, I don't understand how to take the, uh, the conclusion of the arguments made from that particular, uh, that, particular, um, uh, that particular fact that the universe had a beginning. How, how can we have any awareness of, or any mode of description which is appropriate to whatever brought the universe into creation. Um, and what I'd also like to, to challenge is, the, is also the, the appeal to metaphysical foundational principles, as in nothing can come of nothing. Everything requires a cause. Principles of that kind, the kind I was talking about uh, which Aquinas used. Because the longer we go on, the more it seems that those principles themselves can be challenged. And in fact, we don't think of the fact that a particular radio atom decayed at a certain time can be, can be regarded, the, the fact that it, behaved, that it decayed at that time can be said to have a cause. There are very strong theoretical and physical reasons for denying that that it was caused to decay at that time. There's a certain probability of it decaying. We know that, if it, for instance, if it was a strontium-90 uh, strontium atom, well, it was 50-50 in 28 years. But the fact that it decayed at 9 o'clock on March the 23rd, that's not caused. Uh, let me finally, uh, uh, since I only have another five minutes left, discuss the anthropic principle argument. And this is the argument from uh, from the fine-tuning, so to say, and the small chance that that would produce, um, produce the effect we, 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 we live with, um, to the idea that that was evidence that's a cause. And I'll do it by means of a narrative story. Um, if the assassin in 1914 had not shot the Archduke, Archduke Ferdinand in Sarajevo, or if, he, if the assassin had only wounded him, the First World War would probably not have happened. In that case, my father would have graduated from Cambridge in 1917 and never have met my mother, who only went up to Cambridge for the first time in the 1920s. Again, if the bullet that actually hit my father during that war had been a very, very small distance to the left, or if he had been a very, very small distance to the right, then he would have not gone back to Cambridge uh, after the, when the war was over, he would have been there inscribed on the rolls of our glorious dead. And if my mother, who incidentally was given very little chance of surviving a bout of diphtheria when she was about eight years old, had not decided to go up to Cambridge for one weekend 
1921, uh, she would have never have met my father. Thus, you see, the chances of my co ever coming to existence are, were very, very tiny indeed. Does this mean that it was the cunning of history or the sagacity of the Owl of Minerva, to use a uh, philosophical term, that brought me into the universe? Was there a hidden hand at work so that I, who, whose existence is a, in my present state is a, is a very, very, very unlikely event, <coughs> uh, does that prove that this was, that my existence was the result of choice by some agency or other? The argument, the, the argument doesn't follow. We have a situation where, yes, there was a very small chance of a particular, uh, particular initial uh, configuration of the universe. But given any configuration that you care to name, there was a very, very, very small chance of that particular configuration taking place. Different configurations, different, follow, uh, different things following. The fact that the fact that this particular universe was extremely unlikely doesn't mean that uh, it, 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 that fact does not mean it was an act of choice. The fact of any particular universe was extremely unlikely because uh, small differences in this initial configuration would have produced different universes. We can't argue back from the result to the causal agency at work <coughs> in, the, uh, in the initial state. Thank you. Remember, I said I was going to defend two basic contentions in tonight's debate, and I'd like to review those at this time to see how they fare. First, I argued that agnosticism is untenable in various ways and presented a four-point critique of agnosticism. First, I said that ornery agnosticism is philosophically untenable, that no one has produced a proof that shows that knowledge of God is impossible. And in fact, I think Dr. Hughes basically agrees with this point in tonight's debate that you cannot show that the, you can't know that God exists. It's going to be a matter of how you weigh the probabilities. Secondly, I said, however, ordinary agnosticism is practically untenable. And here Dr. Hughes says, well, skepticism about the external world is practically untenable. That's true. But you can be a happy ag agnostic. That's not practically untenable. Well, I think that that's simply not the case. I suspect that people who are happy agnostics really, in fact, believe that God does not exist, that they really think that probably there is no God, uh, not simply that they lack a God belief. Let me use another illustration uh, called the, the philosopher's ass, or the, the philosopher's donkey, uh, an animal who's located between two equally appetizing piles of hay, and as a result, starves to death because he's unable to go to either one. Uh, the philosopher Leibniz pointed out that this is practically impossible. There would have to be a plane dividing the universe into two absolutely identical halves which pass through the center of the philosopher's ass and would uh, paralyze him in this way. Well, it's the same with the agnostic's ass. He will uh, either incline to atheism or theism, whichever one seems the most probable. So I think it's important to understand that really agnosticism isn't a worldview itself. There isn't any alternative in between theism and atheism. Either God exists or he doesn't. And it's up to us to try to figure out to the best of our ability which one of these is probably true. Now thirdly, I said agnosticism is existentially untenable. Although Dr. Hughes hasn't answered this yet, I want to reinforce it because I think it's so important. There are two essential foundation stones lacking uh, in the atheistic worldview, which I think make agnosticism an untenable position. First, there is no absolute standard for moral values. 
Atheists like Sartre and Camus saw that if there are no God-given values, then that means that each person has to create his own values. And that leads immediately to relativism and subjectivism, which means you cannot condemn, say, the Nazi war criminal who chooses anti-Semitism as one of his values. Uh, so that if you don't know whether God exists or not, you don't know whether there are any moral values to follow. You don't know how to order your life, which is impossible practically because every day you do uh, order your life according to whether or not you think there are moral values or not. Secondly, death removes any grounds for adopting the moral point of view. On the atheistic view, the contributions of the scientist to the advance of human knowledge, the researches of the doctor to alleviate suffering in the world, the efforts of the diplomat to bring peace, all of these ultimately come to nothing. They're all doomed to destruction in the final heat death of the universe. Ultimately, it makes no difference how you live. Stuart C. Easton has quite appropriately said, there is no objective reason why man should be moral unless morality pays off in his social life or makes him feel good. There is no objective reason why man should do anything save for the pleasure that it affords him. Now, if that is the case, it makes a radical difference to you whether or not God exists. The idea of a happy agnostic who just blindly goes along through life, I think, hasn't truly comprehended the consequences of this choice. And therefore, I think it's existentially untenable to be an agnostic. By your behavior every day, you answer the question, whether or not you think there is meaning and value to your life. And the way you answer that practical question by how you live will determine whether or not in your heart you're a theist or an atheist, uh, regardless of whether you give lip service to agnosticism. Finally, number four, I said rational agnosticism isn't incompatible with Christianity. And here I think we agree. Even if you don't think that the proofs for God are uh, convincing, Nevertheless, you can be a Christian simply on the basis of having a personal experience of God in your own life, uh, an experience that I have found daily in my own existence and uh, guides and directs my life uh, as a Christian philosopher uh, every day so that you don't need to be uh, an argumentative theist in order to be a Christian believer. So for all of these reasons, I think agnosticism is untenable. Now, what about my reasons that I gave for thinking that Christianity is rationally well-founded? First, I said the evidence points to a creator of the universe. Here, Dr. Hughes has two objections. First, he, he says this choice to create the universe was made out of time, and we don't have any clear understanding of this. I, I've worked on this problem a lot myself, and I don't think it's as intractable as he, he presents it. Choice, I would argue, is not a time-bound motion. Deliberation is something that takes time. But the idea of an eternal choice to create a temporal universe, I think, makes perfectly good sense. It means that God is a timeless being who chooses timelessly to create a universe in time. And he could have just as easily, timelessly willed not to create a universe in time. My own view is that God exists timelessly without creation alone, but in, enters into time at the moment of creation, and so is in creation, subs or in time, subsequent to the motion, no, uh, subsequent to the moment of creation. And I think this is a perfectly uh, rational metaphysical view of the origin of the universe. Secondly, says he objects to these metaphysical principles being imported here. Now certainly there are metaphysical principles at play. The pr premise that everything that begins to exist has a cause is a metaphysical principle. But to my mind, this is one of the most intuitively obvious things that uh, we can reflect on. The uh, intuition behind this is that something cannot come out of absolutely nothing. Uh, something cannot just pop into being out of nothing. Nobody believes that a Bengal tiger, say, or an Eskimo village could suddenly pop into nothing, uh, into existence out of nothing in this room right now. Uh, and there's no reason to think that the whole universe could just pop into being uncaused out of non-being. I mean, think of it this way. Prior to the beginning of the universe, there wasn't even the potentiality for the universe's existence. So how could the universe come to exist if there wasn't even the potentiality for its existence? On the theistic view, the potential for the existence of the universe lay in the power of God to create it. So it seems to me that the origin of the universe, which is pointed to by both philosophical argument and scientific evidence, evidence fairly cries out for a transcendent cause and creator of the universe. 
Now, Dr. Hughes says, but don't we have an exception to this principle, this metaphysical principle, in quantum events, such as the decay of a radium atom? Not at all. Even if there are quantum events that uh, occur uncaused, there is no exception to the principle that something cannot come out of nothing, that whatever begins to exist has a cause, even in the quantum realm. On quantum theories, there is always the underlying quantum uh, mechanical vacuum, which is a sea of fluctuating energy that has physical properties, is definitely not nothing. So that there is no exception uh, to this principle. It is not only metaphysically obvious, but I think it is one of the most empirically confirmed and established principles that there, there is. Certainly, it seems more probable than the opposite, and that's all I'm arguing. I mean, are you really going to say that the alternative to theism is to say that the universe popped into existence uncaused out of nothing? If that's the alternative, how can anyone say that is more probable than that God created the universe? Uh, it seems to me that the, the rational view is to believe that uh, there is a creator God of the universe. Secondly, I looked at the argument from design and pointed out the incredible improbability of these, this initial uh, complex balance of conditions in the Big Bang for intelligent life. And Dr. Hughes responds by saying, well, any event, even my own existence, has an enormously improbable set of conditions. Well, I think that there's a difference here, and let me tell you a couple of stories now to illustrate why I think they are. Imagine that you're dragged in front of a firing squad with a hundred trained marksmen with uh, rifles pointed at your heart. And you hear the command given, and then the deafening roar of the guns, and then you observe that you're still alive that all of the hundred marksmen missed. Now, would you accept it as an explanation for that by someone saying, well, you know, if they uh, had not missed, then you wouldn't be here to be alive to be surprised at it. So you shouldn't really be surprised they all missed because if they had, had not missed, you wouldn't be here to be surprised about it. Not at all. You would think that obviously this improbability calls for an explanation. Or imagine a silk merchant who is showing us a lovely piece of silk that he wants us to buy, only it happens that his thumb just happens to be covering the moth hole in the drape of silk that he's showing us. Well, now, you might say, uh, someone might say, well, he wasn't trying to cheat you. Any position on the drape of silk was equally improbable for his thumb to be there. Would you accept that as an explanation for why it just happened to be over the moth hole? Not at all. Why not? Well, the difference in these cases is that in these sorts of cases, there is what John Leslie, a philosopher of science, calls a tidy explanation for why these improbabilities are as they are, rather than otherwise. In the case of the firing squad, in the case of the silk merchant, this tidy explanation is that the marksmen uh, were not aiming correctly, they deliberately missed, or that the silk merchant wanted to cheat you. Similarly, with the initial conditions of the universe, there's a very tidy explanation for why these are as they are, namely, the universe appears to be absolutely fine-tuned for intelligent life with a mind to find uh, complexity and improbability because it was fine-tuned for intelligent life. There is an intelligent designer and artificer of the cosmos. If you see a watch on the ground, you wouldn't say, well, any arrangement of elements is equally improbable. You would immediately recognize the process and presence of design. Well, the initial conditions of the universe show incomprehensibly more evidence of intelligence and design in their complexity and improbability than does a simple watch. So I think it's quite probable to believe that the universe is the product of intelligent design, not blind chance. Thirdly, I argue that the evidence points to God as a source of moral values, and we've yet to hear a response to that. Number four, the evidence points to God's existence as he's revealed himself in the resurrection of Jesus. That is why I'm a Christian theist, because I think in the resurrection of Jesus we have evidence for a divine miracle. The best explanation of the events of the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus is that God has intervened in history in a decisive revelation of himself. So for all of these reasons, it seems to me that when I weigh the evidence for atheism versus the evidence for Christian theism, Christian theism stands intellectually head and shoulders above the atheistic worldview, and therefore I count myself uh, confidently and enthusiastically a Christian. Now, third round, each of the presenters will be given eight minutes in which to rebut any of the positions of 
having been presented earlier this evening. Uh, as I said earlier, this is the um, round in which I was going to talk about issues connected with uh, the meaning of life and the value of ethical, uh, of, uh, ethical views. But before that, I can't avoid uh, making three basic points about what you've just heard, because it confirms something which I said earlier, that people are very likely, very likely, to start talking about the world we live in and assume that the same principles can be extended to, to the, such events as the creation of the universe. In other words, to events beyond the scope of our customary experience. I don't think it's a valuable argument to, to argue from the, the unlikelihood or the impossibility of the existence of a Bengal tiger or an Eskimo village to the way the universe might behave. We have everyday experience. And in everyday experience, things do not just pop into existence. Secondly, we were given the alternatives, the alternative explanations did the universe just come out of nothing, or was it created by a god? Well, there you're given them as though you choose one or you choose the other. But there are many kinds of god. Which kind of god are we being given? And if we're, if we're asked to do it in terms of probability, then we may say that our everyday experience inclines us, inclines us powerfully to say it was created by something. But when we reflect on the different kinds of creators there might be, then we realize we have nothing to go on, apart from the fact that the university, uh, the, the universe, I beg your pardon, uh, sometimes feels like the, uni the university is the university, uh, uh, that the universe uh, was, was in fact created. And for what end, we don't know. And don't forget, that in the same way that life created us, the, the possibility of life created us, it also created all sorts of strange microbes, viruses. Was it created for them too? Or for them especially? Why for us especially? And the third is that the powerful use of explanation by analogy. Explanation by analogy is fine in, li in a limited sense. In that one uh, in a particular sense in science, where one may explain the behavior of light by analogy with, with uh, light with it by analogy with water waves, but then we can check the extent to which the analogy does and doesn't work. When we refer back to the Creator as such, describing Him by analogy with ourselves as the maker of choices, albeit choices somehow made independently of time, so it's not like us, very like us. We're in very, we're in very deep waters here, and they're waters where I find it not profitable to swim, or in fact I find myself gasping for air quite a lot of the time. Okay, meaning. Now, um, I find the notion of meaning in life a slightly squelchy notion. It doesn't even have any clear-cut sense to me, um, and it's all too often used in, in um, rather condescending phrases like, these festivities gave meaning to their drab lives, and things like that. Um, now, I do think, however, that the notion of bringing meaning to a life is revealing. It suggests that meaning does indeed come from outside, and that's in fact something that um, Professor Craig suggests. That a solitary existence, a sort of Robinson Crusoe existence, is not an existence with particular meaning. But my, my recommendation to all of you is to find meaning in your life, not, by, uh, not necessarily by turning to, uh, uh, to, to, a, to a, a divine person, but to your fellow, fellow human beings. And it seems to me the shared practices of our culture allow us to do that, and conversely, Individuals can be said to lead meaningful lives um, when these practices, uh, 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 when they engage in such practices and lead 
meaning less lives when these practices have broken down. These practices of mutual support and mutual enjoyment. They may be ceremonial practices, like a state funeral, for instance, or a graduation ceremony, or they may be just domestic practices, like playing chess every Thursday evening with a friend. Um, so my strong view is that the meaning we, uh, that infuses our life arrives there because of the social context in which we live. Let me go turn to the ethics. We had a very strong, a very strong rejection of the view that ethics need not have foundations. Um, sorry, I've left a piece of paper behind. My view is that if we think in terms of ethics rather than moral theory, um, if we study persons and their virtues rather than actions, then in fact we get a very different view on ethics than the one that's been current, on, on, on moral morality than the one that's been current in recent years. <coughs> ethics arises from an ethos, from a shared culture the culture in which we live, in which we very often find competing values. Now that's something which a foundationalist finds it very hard to cope with, but is nevertheless true. Um, it is very nevertheless true that there are such things as moral dilemmas. Now I don't deny that the view I'm advocating, that ethics arises within a social context, gives rise to a whole slew of philosophical problems, but we don't have time I'm afraid to go into there. One thing I want to say is that the, that the rejection of ultimate foundations does not mean that ethical choices are simply arbitrary. When we find that the same kinds of values have, have uh, persisted through a given cultural tradition, when they moved on from one cultural tradition to another in the way that Christianity took over as the four cardinal virtues, the teachings uh, from the uh, ancient pagan world, then that suggests that these modes of evaluations cannot be dismissed as simply arbitrary. To put it another way, it is just not true that if God is dead, everything is permitted. And point, uh, the point that's a corollary of that is the rejection of a demand for foundations does not mean the rejection of what we often refer to as Christian ethics. And in fact, for most of us here, it would be very hard for us to live that kind of life, simply because that is the tradition with which our culture, our various cultures, uh, have by and large lived for many hundreds of years. And I'll come back to this in my closing, in my closing remarks. Thank you. that I've presented, my first two arguments against agnosticism, that ordinary agnosticism is philosophically untenable, that ordinary agnosticism is practically untenable, uh, still seem to me to be standing unanswered. Now what about my third argument, that agnosticism is existentially untenable? Here, Dr. Hughes says that we can find meaning in supporting one's uh, fellow man and social uh, endeavors. When I speak of the meaning of life, I'm using the term in the sense of significance of life, the importance, making a difference, what does it matter? And my contention, which I submit to you as obvious is, that while these activities that he mentioned are meaningful in the context of a theistic view of life, they become meaningless within an atheistic framework because ultimately it doesn't make any difference. It doesn't matter. It all turns out the same anyway. Everything is simply doomed to destruction. J.P. Moreland, a Christian philosopher, has said that the radical nature of this thesis is that if there is no moral truth to be discovered, and if I have to simply choose the moral point of view because that type of life is what I find worthwhile for myself, then the decision is arbitrary, rationally speaking. 
And the difference between, say, Mother Teresa and Hitler is roughly the same as the difference between whether I want to be a trumpet player or a baseball player. There is no rational fact <coughs> or truth of the matter at stake. Now, if this is the case, then what is the difference, let's say, between becoming a doctor and feeding the poor and just sitting around and pinching the heads off of flies? Ultimately, it doesn't make any difference. So it seems to me that these activities that we do think are valuable and meaningful in our life lose their significance and meaning in the context of an atheistic worldview. Secondly, what about moral values? Dr. Hughes says, well, we draw moral values from the social context, and these aren't arbitrary. Well, right, they're not arbitrary in the sense that they're socio-biologically drilled into us by evolution and the cultures that we're raised in. But that doesn't provide any objective foundation for these things. As I said, rape isn't really wrong. It's just sociobiologically disadvantageous on the atheistic view. And if you reject the views of the culture and society you were raised in, there's nothing wrong with that. Now, I, I think this has critical dimensions to it, as was shown in a recent book by Peter Haas called Morality After Auschwitz. He asks in this book the question, how could an entire society have willingly participated in a state-sponsored program of mass torture and genocide for over a decade without any serious opposition. His answer is interesting. He says this, far from being contemptuous of ethics, the perpetrators acted in strict conformity with an ethic which held that however difficult and unpleasant the task might have been, mass extermination of the Jews and gypsies was entirely justified. The Holocaust was possible only because a new ethic was in place that did not define the arrest and deportation of Jews as wrong, and in fact defined it as ethically tolerable and even good. What Haas goes on to point out is that because of the coherence and the internal consistency of the Nazi ethic, he says the Nazi ethic could not be discredited from within. It was an internally consistent ethic. They simply rejected the values of Western democratic societies. The fact that the Western democracy sat in judgment in Nuremberg, a bar Nazi Germany, showed that moral values are not just relative and socially uh, conditioned, that there is a transcendent source of moral values which points ultimately to God as their source. This is what I think Thomas Jefferson saw when he wrote that all men are created equal and are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. Human rights and the dignity of man are ultimately rooted in God as the source of absolute moral values and human rights. Once you get rid of that, there is simply no way to found an objective, transcultural system of ethics. Kai Nielsen, who is an atheistic ethicist, admits this point. Listen to Nielsen's conclusion. We have not been able to show that reason requires the moral point of view, or that all really rational persons, unhoodwinked by myth and ideology, should not be individual egoists or classical amoralists. Reason doesn't decide here. The picture I have painted for you is not a pleasant one. Reflection on it depresses me. Pure practical reason, even with a good knowledge of the facts, will not take you to morality. Now that has awesome consequences for our lives because it means that insofar as you choose to live morally and as though your life does have objective meaning, you tacitly affirm the existence of God. And that's why I think that agnosticism is simply existentially untenable. Uh, finally, number four, we agreed that rational agnosticism isn't incompatible with Christianity anyway, and therefore I think we've seen that rational agnosticism is simply rather irrelevant. Now what about my arguments for the uh, Christian faith? First, the evidence points to God as the creator of the universe. <coughs> Dr. Hughes says, you can't extend the causal principle from our experience to the origin of the universe. I think that you can, and I gave an argument for that based on potentiality. No potency can actualize itself. You need something actual to actualize a potentiality. In the case of the universe, you don't even have any potentiality prior to its existence. So that it's metaphysically impossible for the universe to originate in this way. He also says, well, which kind of God created the universe? I've already given some of the central attributes of this God. It must be an uncaused, timeless, immaterial, uh, eternal, and transcendent being which brought the universe into existence. Moreover, we've seen on the basis of my other arguments that it must be a personal and intelligent creator. It must be 
uh, or rather he must be the source of absolute goodness and moral value, and finally he is the God who has revealed himself in the person of Jesus Christ and in his resurrection from the dead. Remember, the arguments don't just stand one by one. It's not like a, 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 a chain where it's only as strong as the weakest link. It's more like a coat of chain mail where all of the arguments uh, interlock and the mail is not simply as strong as its weakest link. And I think the cumulative case of these arguments make theism, Christian theism, vastly more probable than the atheistic worldview. What about the argument from design? Well, here, Dr. Hughes says, well, why think that God created the universe for us? I'm not necessarily arguing he created it for us. I think even the existence of a lowly mosquito uh, or, or a lower form of life is so fantastically improbable when you study it biologically that even that would call for an intelligent designer and creator of the universe. A single-celled animal, uh, if it were the size of the city of London, say, would be a factory that would be inconceivably complex beyond human ability to construct. The complexity is so great, even in a single cell. So I, I'm not necessarily arguing that the universe was created for us. What about the fact that arguments from analogy are fuzzy? Well, I don't know what weight to give to this objection. It just seems to me that here we have either chance or design, and the chances are so few Design provides, as Leslie says, a tidy explanation of what we find here, and therefore it seems to me that design is the better explanation. Finally, the evidence points to God as a source of moral values. I think I've defended that. And then God's revealing himself in the resurrection of Jesus hasn't been contested. So it seems to me that, again, on balance, uh, the agnostic viewpoint simply isn't justified. It's more rational to adopt the viewpoint of Christian theism.